Hello, everyone. Today, we have a special guest, Jason, CEO of Ecom Solutions. Yes, Ecom Solutions, also doing business as Bold City Distributors, but like Mark. we're known as Ecom Solutions. Yes. Let's have some questions for you. Ellie and I are partners right now with you, and we just started our journey in the middle of March. So we have some experience and we have some questions for you to ask. Absolutely. Ellie. Thank you for having me. Excited to be here. Excited to just talk with y'all and answer any questions that y'all have and share what it is that we're doing with your audience. Nice. Jason, when did you start Amazon? What year was it and how you start? What model was it? In the very, very beginning of 2014, back when drop shipping was a thing. So back in those days, I was looking for a way to make some money. Amazon seemed pretty cool. I learned this idea of drop shipping from Amazon to eBay. There was this multi-level marketing company that was teaching it. It was called Dropship Domination. It was pretty cool. So started doing that in like December of 2013. And I was making some sales selling products that Amazon was selling on eBay. And then I figured that I might as well try to do this on Amazon since they allowed third-party sellers. And I got started listing stuff from Walmart. And getting the arbitrage opportunities and making tons of sales in the very, very beginning. It was like the Wild West back then. So the platform has evolved a lot over the years. But drop shipping for a while was a it was a gold mine. So that was initially how we got started in the world of selling on Amazon. And within that first year, had some success. So I started teaching other people how to do it. And that's actually when we started building Ecom Solutions. So like the actual platform that you're using right now, we've been working on it now for eight years. So we started working on it in actual, like we launched it in July of 2015. And it's had plenty of iterations. It started as a dropship platform. It's morphed now into a wholesale platform. However, there was a lot of things that had to happen in between for us to go from drop shipper to wholesale FBA service provider. When did you switch? St started trying to switch when you started noticing that Amazon's cracking down on drop shipping. So like year one, year two, it was wild west. You'd get IP complaints. Nobody even knew what an IP complaint was. Nobody cared. Amazon wasn't enforcing IP. There was nothing. And then like year three, so that'd be what? 2017, you started noticing it's getting harder and harder. And all along, Amazon had a rule against drop shipping. They had the drop ship policy violation where you're not allowed to have something that shows up in a box that is identified for another retailer, or you're not allowed to have a invoice in the box from the other retailer. For the longest time, they didn't actually enforce that, but they started enforcing it a little bit more, a little bit more. It started initially with IP complaints. So you'd get suspended for IP complaints. You'd grovel, you'd beg, you'd get your account back. They'd let you keep going. And then as the years went on, you just realized like they're not going to stop. They're not going to stop pinning down drop shippers. And it, it was almost like for a while you could get away with it. And then it got harder. Then it got harder. Then it got harder. Like you could do it for, let's say a year before you would get pegged and then you would get nailed. And then it got to be like, you could do it for maybe six months. And then it got to three months. And then it's now it's like, if you do it, they're going to catch you almost immediately. And now the suspension seems to be a lot worse. So. In that time frame, we had a lot of money kind of tied up in the investment into e-com. And it was essentially like, we need to figure out a way to transition into the world of wholesale. So started doing it. Initially started teaching people the very same way that we did with drop shipping. Started teaching people how to do wholesale. And then what we realized in this time frame, this is probably about 20... 17 to 2018, we're trying to make this transition. So this is the first attempt at like how we got here, where we're at today. 
we started teaching it, you realize everyone has the same problem establishing supply relationships. And even if they can, something as simple as like formatting a price file or a spreadsheet was like another thing that would trip people up. You know, like that Mm -hmm. would be generally somewhere that people would have an issue, not including let's just ignore prep as like a, another pain point. So we put together like, this is what we started trying this idea of the buyer's club, right? The idea of kind of like what e-com is today we attempted it in about 2018. And the way that we did it back then was we would give everyone a spreadsheet of the same exact products. And it just, it didn't work as well as it did. We just didn't know what we didn't know. So we sort of like slinked ourselves back into getting back into drop shipping because we were making money. 2020 comes around and you just really realize that if we don't, if we don't make this transition at some point, then it's going to, it's going to end with a net zero for e-com to where all the investment that went into e-com turns into zero. So that's when we started building what is now known as Seats, which is the database that sort of simplified the process of sourcing products. Because that was like whenever you run a file through one of those price finders, or you know, it's that moment in time. And as we all know, everything on Amazon is always adjusting up and down based on selling competition. So we started building seats in actually 2020. We launched in August of 2020. And ever since then, we've just been putting our best foot forward every single day trying to connect supply. So the whole idea with what we've always wanted to try to do, even when we were drop shipping, it, it was to kind of become the Google of e-commerce to where it it was easy to find stuff. And that's, I guess, what we're trying to accomplish is we're trying to connect supply to people who want to get access to supply without having to necessarily go out there and establish all of those relationships on their own. So that's what we're essentially, that's what we've been doing every single day is just building our relationships with our suppliers and trying to share those relationships with people who want to sell on Amazon, but don't want to go through maybe the years that it takes to get to the point where you can actually do this thing on any sort of scale. Cause like without, without like partnering with us, it's not like you can't do it. You can absolutely can. I would never say that someone can't, it's just going to cut the learning curve down significantly because you're not going to have to go through applying for a whole bunch of wholesalers or figuring out how to format spreadsheets or figuring out how to get the products prepped into Amazon, all of which they're not like insanely difficult problems. But I think when you combine it into one for someone that's like starting out or newer in the space, each of those areas are each of those hurdles is somewhat challenging. And if you're like to think of filling up a funnel, where like you put a hundred people at the top of the funnel, 50 of them fall out immediately when it comes to establishing relationships. And then 40 people are going to really struggle finding something. They're going to get a relationship established and then you're going to hear, oh, but I can't find anything. There's nothing profitable, right? Because like there, there's the skill that goes into learning that. And then, you know, the last probably something that you see solved more, which is the prep side of things. But even that is somewhat challenging because you you really don't know what that prep center is going to be like, right? When you establish a relationship with a prep center, are they good? Are they not good? I don't know. And if they happen to not be good, you know, could end up just being more of a headache. So if you think of like filling up a funnel, we're trying to solve the big challenges that you're going to have, at least going through the first several years. Like we think of what we aim to do, our little catchphrase, our motto is we turn months of work into minutes. If you think of when you sign into e for the very first time, there's literally been tens of thousands of hours that have been put into building the database of products because there's no like robot that can do it. I wish there was an AI that could do it. Then we could just go through like everything and it's like, but there isn't. You have to match stuff up and it has to be accurate with what's on the Amazon catalog and haven't figured out a way to just do it without human beings and labor. So like when someone does get started with us, like it is literally tens of thousands of hours worth of energy that's been put into that, that someone doesn't necessarily have to 
solve on their own so that you can at least start making sales and then deal with all the other crap that you're going to have to deal with on Amazon. All the other Amazon issues throw at you, but it's not going to be, I can't get access to supply. Yeah. So. I wanted to add to that. It's also the OnePlus Ecom solution has the amount you can buy. Because I tried what you said to do it on my own. And yes, like I opened the account, I submitted my reseller certificate, went, went through many products. And then let's say I found three products. And in order for them to ship it to me cheaply, I need to order a pallet. I don't want to order a pallet of three but items because it's going to be a lot of products and a lot of things could happen. So with Ecom, like you guys still have minimum order per item. But it's still minimum is like almost. It's a, like a case. You know, yeah. It, it's a case it's, of something. Just buy 12 of them. And, and if it sells, you can always replenish. So it's not too difficult or too different from the online arbitrage. Just it's a little bit easier. That's what we came from. And yeah, it's like 12 items or 18 items mean it's nothing. And a lot of time it's just one. And it's also like a good benefit. Yeah, yeah. To speak to that, I think the one of the perks is the fact that we're able to combine a lot. Of, like, because we do have minimum order sizes that we have to fill with some of the suppliers. If you guys notice that, well, you gals, you ladies, I shouldn't say, y'all notice that like every 10 days we do a big push for supplier 927, right? Because they have a minimum order that we have to fill in order for us to process the stuff. And their products happen to go really, really fast. So we keep them up for 36 hours. And then we basically do a blitz and we're able to build enough of a purchase order for us to send it in. Whereas like it used to be when it was just us buying, we'd have to spend a lot of time to compile enough of an order to send it in on our own. Whereas by us being able to combine everyone together, it's not as hard for us to meet that. And when the pallets come in, we're able to break it down. We say, Marina got 10 of this. She got 20 of this. She got five of this. And we're able to break it up and kind of move it into your store. So yeah, I guess, like you said, sort of like online arbitrage a little bit where you're not required to order in such large quantities in order to, in some cases, I guess, just establish an account, right? That's usually when you have to make the big order is to establish a wholesale account. Whereas like with us, the accounts are established. All sellers, they always have the minimum order, thousand dollars. And then you can order smaller amounts, but the big one, and that the big one is the one when you don't really know what wholesaler has in their catalog. And another hard part he had with wholesale was most of them require a warehouse or they want a commercial address and you can't really ship the door, <laughs> the garage, or if it's straight, you can still it, but it just, they don't accept it. It's in their policy. But who wants to get pallet shipped to their house anyways? What if you Right. on the second floor well i would say like a lot of hostels actually have like pretty low minimum let's say 25 250 300 the problem that with that amount they ship let's say fedex or ups and the shipping would eat the whole profit and that's the thing the shipping will be too expensive that it will go unprofitable a lot of time that's my experience with doing wholesale myself because it just doesn't make sense, like profit wise. Yeah, like selling on Amazon is not this huge margin. Every little thing counts. Every little detail counts. If you're having to pay shipping from the supplier and then you have to pay prep and then you got to pay shipping back into Amazon, you know, by the time it gets in there, it's like, there's all your margin. Yeah. That does make it challenging, especially considering on Amazon, you are competing against some stores that are well-established already. And they've got the discounts. They've got the, they've got, they're ordering in enough bulk from supplier where they've got the advantage over you. If you're competing just based on your need to order in enough bulk to compete against that particular seller, because they're not paying the inbound shipping from the supplier. Whereas if you're paying the inbound shipping, you're like naturally at a disadvantage right there. And to your point on the, of having a facility, that's just a whole nother game. If you have to have a warehouse, now you have a lead, you have labor cost, and are the people going to show up to work today? That's what we got to deal with all the time is you like equipment, the job. Sh shelves, the machine, the forks that you need to lift them. So everything adds up. 
Yeah. Yeah. And that makes it really challenging for a seller to go from, I want to get into wholesale to, wow, this is going to be insanely hard because every single one of these steps, a lot of people go the route of prep centers, but even running a prep center has got its challenges because again, you're dealing with labor and it's not the most glamorous job. So generally you're going to have turnover in that position. So, you know, if you're, if you decide, Hey, I'm going to go the route of doing a warehouse and I'm going to try to get my production costs as low as humanly possible. Still now, it's like a new skill has to be developed, which is managing a team of people and keeping them happy enough to show up for work. Warehouse part of what Icarm does, it's more difficult than getting the wholesalers and creating the big orders and fulfilling them. So why, uh, how did you get into the warehouse thing and do prep as well? Was it because you were doing it already for yourself and you just decided to go? Yeah, good question. Um, so again, we were making the transition from dropshipper into wholesale. And I realized if we're going to take on the expense of a warehouse, that's a whole new, that's a whole new thing that we're not really conditioned to be paying for at this point. Yeah. In the beginning, it was really all about trying to pull resources together in order to be able to afford the warehouse. If I'm just being completely honest and transparent with you, it's hard to do that because we have on the payroll that I care deeply about. And it's like, I'm trying to protect their job. Yeah. I mean, having the warehouse just adds a lot of complexity to it. And for us, the only way that it will work is if we control the entire flow of the process. In the very like first month, two months, like September, 2020, October, 2020, we moved into our first facility. It was a 3000 square foot warehouse and we were trying to use a prep center, but you know, the complexity of the business, whereas like you're getting these mixed shipments coming in that might have a whole, we didn't have as many people at that time, but you still have the complexity of who's this supposed to go? How many is supposed to go to them and coordinating that whole thing that we couldn't do it through a prep center. So the only way that we were able to accomplish this was by, you could say, take the risk of running the warehouse. You know? That I think that whether it's us providing the service or as a seller, that's like the fork in the road that you got to be able to figure out that, that fork in the road, which is, am I going to take on a warehouse or am I going to try to leverage a service like what we provide? That That's the whole goal is to provide a service that's valuable enough to where you don't have to go out there you don't have a desire to even try to go out there in at least not year one or two. Maybe as you scale up and you grow and you get big enough and you're like, I could probably do the prep for less than I'm paying for if I incur this based on the amount of volume that I'm doing. But to get there, it's generally going to be a couple years worth of kind of work. Messing up and then fixing. Yeah. I think it's your warehouse right now. Huge. Um, <laughs> It's 30,000 square feet facility. 10,000 of it is office space. We don't fill up a lot of the office space. We don't have as many people work in the office as we do in the actual warehouse, which is 20,000 square feet. Any given moment, there are nine or 10 people were in the actual warehouse itself. You have a person that's receiving products, checking them in. So whenever the trucks back up and they offload the pallets, got to check it in, got to figure out like, who's this belong to? There's a process to receive it. Then it makes its way up to the production line and you know, everything that goes in between. And you have a couple people who are really responsible for creating the shipping plans. So there's two people that that's really all they do is they coordinate. They say, all right, this is all the stuff that we're going to be sending out for this store. We got to coordinate like the shipping plan, create the shipping plan. And then the products move into the production teams who are Doing the the fun of labeling stuff and prepping it and putting it in the poly bags and doing the multi pack and all the fun stuff that goes in the prep. But it doesn't seem like you are at full capacity yet with the warehouse, right? That's still a lot of room to grow there. We have plenty of space to grow up. So we have like a really big rack system. We have a ton of racks. We're getting a machine. Like right now, we can't get it onto like the second and third layer levels easily of the rack. Uh, the rack system. So we're getting a piece of equipment that, by the way, 15 grand for this piece of equipment, like 15,000 so we can get stuff higher. But no, we're not at capacity. Like I think if anything, as we grow, we can grow another shift. We could have, instead of just one shift a day, you could have multiple shifts and you can move more things to the facility. And then there's the possibility at some point for us to maybe be able to like do some storage to where instead of if, if someone wanted to place a big enough order 
instead of shipping it all in, especially as Amazon keeps adjusting their storage limits and stuff to where we could keep here and get it onto like a, a somewhere where it's not just going to be in the way of the actual production team. But yeah, I don't, as far as like storage is concerned, we're nowhere near filling up the space. It's, it really is helpful having as much space as we have. I would say that if, if, as we really use the racks better or have the ability to use the racks better, then it would seem like there's a lot less stuff than it might seem like if I was to walk out there right now or some of it. It might be like, oh, this person's at hazmat limits, can't send in. And it's like a, um, a pallet full of Zep cleaner. And, you know, the, 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 those bottles, they're not huge, but a pallet of it, it, it yeah. takes up a pretty good bit of space, especially like with hazmat where you don't have that much space so that, mm -hmm. you know, if we can get it the ground up, it would seem like it freed up a whole lot of space, you know? <laughs> I'd you come solution for what kind of potential part is good and them which both benefits because we both came from first we both did retail arbitrage then we switched mm -hmm. to online arbitrage we still do it and then we came to ecom we more focus now on wholesale business and how much money need to start that's a really good question i would say what we sell to people outside of the service is time so if someone values their time, even if they're newer and they who really get the most out of it are people who have tried to set up the wholesale side, who maybe have a year worth of experience or so selling on Amazon already, who have kind of like gone through some of the learning curve, have proven some indetermination because there's always challenges that you have to deal with on Amazon. So the easiest people already have like a pain that, you know, it's going to be like, I'm doing retail arbitrage, I'm doing online arbitrage, and I want to grow beyond that. Then you have people that have some experience, they've got a few wholesalers that are established, but they're not able to put the time and energy into scaling those relationships. A lot of times people are doing this as a part time thing. A lot of people have full time and you just don't have the time to devote to it, right? So what we sell ultimately to people is time. It could be useful for someone who's just starting out and wants to eliminate a few years worth hard. Not that you're not going to go through the hard lessons. You're just going to escalate the process. You're going to go through it faster. You know, it's going to happen a whole lot faster. At least you're not going to have to solve the part of setting up a relationship with a supplier. You're not going to have to solve the problem of trying to format spreadsheets. So someone who respects their time and values their time, who's willing to invest into not to go about it all themselves. I mean, people who there's two types of people, right? You have people who understand investing into their business and value their time, maybe more than they value the money associated with it. Not to say that, you know, you, people don't value their money. They just say, I, I'm buying into people that are doing this on my behalf or helping provide this on my behalf. Whereas there's also another type of person who values that dollar more than they do their, their time. And those mm -hmm. people tend to not want it. They don't find it as attractive because there's a fee associated with it. And they would rather go for a reason or another, all of the learning curve on their own and go set up the relationships and, and do that stuff. But I would say like in a perfect world, some has some experience selling on Amazon. They've encountered some troubles, at least trying to open up relationships with suppliers. It wasn't as easy as they thought it was going to be. Um, maybe don't have the ability to find products to open up those accounts and order in enough bulk or like you were saying, they just, the little things are eating the profit because they're not ordering enough and they're paying inbound shipping. So that's really who it's for is someone who wants to be able to get involved in wholesale and escalate the process of starting to make sales without necessarily having to figure out the entire picture of it all. Whereas like a mm -hmm. lot of the stuff is figured out where you just have to get good at one thing, which is finding products, making educated decisions on how much you're going to buy, 
and then replenishing the ones that work out and win, keep the best products stocked and just have a method to be able to continue finding stuff. And that's ultimately what we're trying to provide is to give you a little insight to the behind the scenes of what it is that we actually do. We have a team of people that are essentially matching products. So they're taking these price files from the wholesalers and they're matching those products with corresponding ASINs on Amazon. So their job solely is to continue building the database. And our job is to continue building that team. As we build that team out, it allows us to bring on more suppliers and more suppliers means more products. More products means every time that you log in, there's going to be a new opportunity if you're willing to just sit down and do the research. I mean, we've tried to speed it up as fast as humanly possible to find stuff. There's some filters you could put in, but there's going to be stuff that people bought two years ago that they're not replenishing that's available today still, you know? So the value of our database really is <clears throat> not just the sheer number of products. Like that's, we want to have the largest database known to man. If I could have a relationship with every single wholesale supplier out there and get it delivered here to Jacksonville and get every single product into our marketplace, that's the vision. That's what we're trying to accomplish. That way someone doesn't have to go out there and do it. And there's always new opportunities for us to be able to bring to the table. And again, those products, they ebb and flow. How many times have you ever bought a product that was profitable the day that you bought it, but by the time it got into Amazon, not as profitable, you either had to sit on it and wait for it to be profitable again, or you sold it at a loss, like a lot of people tend to do on Amazon. So you're looking for those ebbs and flows, and we're trying to capture those ebbs and flows with the marketplace to where at least we're not having to do the matching process over and over and over and over. As far as the second part of the question, which is how much money is needed, I would say <clears throat> if you're going to work with us because there's a fee involved, if you want it, if you don't care about like the fee per se, you could do it with as little money as you got to get experience. Now, if it's I need to make enough to cover the fee, I would recommend 15 grand minimum to to be able to like give yourself a good shot and that's just being conservative uh, like i know that you could if you're really really picky with the stuff that you buy you could do good there's plenty of stuff with high rois that that you can make a lot of money on but i think if someone's saying i need to cover the cost of this in order for me to feel that this was like a successful thing for me you got to at least have 15 grand to be able to throw into inventory. And that would, in my opinion, be the bare bones minimum. Now, a caveat to that is if you're more interested in wanting to escalate, like speed up, expedite the process of learning, and it's not necessarily year one, I got to make a profit within 30 days, or I'm going to be like homeless. Don't do it. Don't do this. Like go into a service-based business, something that doesn't require capital. But if you're someone that says, I'm willing to make an investment into this to learn the process, and as I start learning the process, I'll be capable of going out there and finding more money, then it doesn't really matter how much you have as long as you're going in there with the right expectations of what you're trying to accomplish. If speeding through the process, I still think if I think of what it is that we provide for someone, knowing Amazon sellers as well as I do, because I've been around the space as long as I have. Most people, they go the route of hiring a virtual assistant and that virtual assistant, essentially, if you look at what it's going to cost for that person for an entire year, it's what we charge. But with us, you get way more than what you would get out of a virtual assistant. You get a whole team of people. You get a like a, a completely, it's not done for you, but it's largely like a lot of the stuff is done for the same cost as you would pay for a or two virtual assistants you I know what i mean yeah that you don't have all the extra expenses for the softwares that you have to provide we have virtual assistant now and we have to have our tactical arbitrage our tactical extender tactical bucket and all of them add up plus not to even calculate the time that it takes for them to go through all those leads 
like your team does. So, yeah, because we know with online arbitrage, a 25%, 30% is very doable. In a wholesale, I'm guessing the margins are a little bit smaller. It's comparable, but I think what differentiates our system, I don't know if this is a disadvantage. I think on the surface, it would look like a disadvantage to where like our ROI is factoring in prep cost already built in, right? Whereas someone that's posting something on Instagram or something showing the orange bars and what their ROI is, that ROI is not counting the prep that goes into it. So that 25% on the surface is really probably like mm -hmm. if you factor in the actual Easily. cost of the prep that goes in. So I would say a healthy operating margin in wholesale, like you're doing really good with us in the 12 to 15 range is going to be like, as far as margin is concerned, that's going to be in the 20 to 25% but that's including already the built-in prep. That's mm -hmm. So there's not like a prep fee that's coming off. So if we're comparing apples to apples and saying, OA 25% plus prep, is, it's, is it really 25% or is it really 10%? You know what I mean? Versus here, 20% and the prep's already there. So there's not like anything off. And there is other risk with online arbitrage that the prices go down by the time they reach Amazon. But with wholesale, how close are we at the bottom of the price? Like, are there any other sellers that can actually get this cheaper than us? Like, what's the risk there? How big is it? You're going to have competition in wholesale, just like you do in anything. I would say in wholesale, you compete probably with bigger stores than you're going to compete with in the OA space. Whereas OA, you might have 70 stores that jump on a listing. There, It's like a lead list. Some lead list and 70 stores ended up jumping on that. It really, at the end of the day, it's not so much the number of sellers as it is supply and demand, right? What's the actual demand of this product, aka how many times does this sell and how many market? Where if we're talking the downside of wholesale, sometimes you might get someone that comes in and buys 300 units on a product that sells a hundred times a month. So the natural byproduct of that is going to be the only way I'm going to be able to sell this. I'm not convinced that they're selling it at a profit either. I'm just convinced that they're making a sale just to make a sale. So you're that just is you're going to be dealing with that on Amazon period. It's not really exclusive of the business. Model. Still going to have comp. I would say where they might like the bigger sellers might end up coming out ahead is going to be on whether or not they're able to get the prep or the order in enough to be able to like fill up a truckload of stuff to send to Amazon to where the inbound shipping is going to be like, instead of it being, let's say 50 cents a unit, if you're calculating it on a unit to where it's 15 cents a unit. So those are kind of like the factors that come into play when it relates to what you're up against as far as like wholesale is concerned. The more volume that you do, the more that you buy, there's always going to be some margin. Even with us, you, if you say, hey, I want to buy a ton of this, you can come to us and say, probably I can get on it. And we'd be happy to go and try to find a better price on it. We want to be treated just as you would treat any wholesaler that you do business with. And the sellers that are getting better pricing, they might not necessarily be getting better. They might just be able to into Amazon a little bit cheaper, which gives them, you know what I'm saying? So maybe that's the sort inbound, of the wiggle room. Even the inbound cost sometime, if they were able to set the pallet instead of me sending a box. Yeah. If I send one unit, if I send this cell phone in, this one unit might cost me what, three bucks or so to send it in. And if I sent a pallet full of these, it would probably cost me 20 cents each. So it's the same concept where the more that you're able to sell in, send into Amazon, you fill up pallet or multiple pallets, you're going to have a cheaper production cost, right? Like cheaper inbound shipping cost. If you're calculating it on the per unit, I don't really recommend people do that. I'm not going to convince people. That's a losing battle for me to try to win anyways. But generally speaking, the bigger the shipment, if you fill up a truck full of stuff, it's going to cost you the least. If you send one unit of something in, it's going to cost you the most. Mm -hmm. If you send a box full of stuff, it's going to cost you more on a unit basis than if you send a pallet in. So 
that's the dynamics. It's the, and I think that's where newer sellers, like they're going to have to get their feet wet. You're going to have to go through that process of figuring out like, in order to build a pallet in wholesale, unless you're ordering like hundreds of any one particular product. And I only advise people do that when you have a big enough budget to, to, I think that it's a good idea to not have any more than five per in a particular product. That way you can play the game a little bit different. Whereas in the event that you had, let's say 50% of your budget in one product, and most people don't do this, but just in, as an example, if you have 50% of your budget in any one product, if I have to, if I have to make that credit card payment in a few weeks, like that might put me into a different position where I have to sell that product versus if I'm putting 5% of my budget in any one product, I'm not as, I don't need to move that as much. Now to kind of round back in, I took a little detour on this, but to bring that back, I think we're for the first several months like as people are like building their product catalog, you're going to probably start with like smaller shipments and then they're going to get a little bit bigger. They're going to get a little bit bigger. They're going to get a little bit bigger. So you're like your per, you're like your shipping costs as a percentage of new, which I really look at shipping costs as a percentage of revenue, as opposed to on a per unit basis, just a tip. It's from an accounting standpoint, it makes more sense for you to look at it that way. On a percentage of revenue basis though, as those shipments get bigger, they're going to become a less percentage of the overall revenue that is generated in the store. So did that answer the question? Definitely. Even some other questions I had in mind, mm -hmm. I, them as you go. So you said you have fee. Let's, uh, can we uh, sh share what is the fee? What's the structure? What goes into inventory? Do sellers obligate? I know the answer, but I want for who will be viewing this, have the answers. Like what's the structure? what you pay money for? Do you obligate to pay, let's say, as much this month or something like that? Sure. So the fee for the service, is that what you want to talk about? Okay. So this is subject to change. I have been known to change it in the past. And at some point, if you're watching this six months from now, it could be completely different than mm -hmm. it is sure. right now. Right now, the fee is $6,000 for the service. We used to offer plans over 12 months, I'm probably going to be doing away with that to where it's six grand or more, which gets, I can get that paid off within a fairly short period of time. Like I give people 60 days or so to pay that. But outside of that, that's the only fee that we charge. What that gets you is access to the service, gets you access to the platform, gets you access to basically everything that's gone in to build the platform. And then there's the cost of the actual goods that you, you got to have the money that like we were just talking about the 15 grand. If you have that liquid or on a credit card or something, that's going to be used to purchase the actual goods themselves. So like our fee is, I think, pretty reasonable for what we provide. We don't have hidden costs or anything like our prep is built into the cost of the product. So there's not a there's not like a bill that comes at the end of the month and say, hey, we just prepped. 400 units, here's another bill. So like, that's just built into like how we do it. If you think of like the 6,000, that essentially kind of the idea is for it to help pay for the whole operation of everything that goes in to the day-to-day -day operational side of the business. And then the markup on the goods essentially pays for the prep side of things to make sure that we have enough flowing in on a regular basis to afford the employees that are actually doing the prep work. So again, subject to change, I have been considering raising it, not because like I want to make it harder for people to get in. It's just there's costs associated with running a business and you got to make a running a business. So it's a lot when you split it out over 12 months, it's just you need lots and lots of people to do it. And you get a more serious person as far as I'm concerned. You do get more serious people when there's a little bit more skin in the game from the get. We don't want everyone. I don't want someone that's going to be stressed. Like we don't want someone that's going to be like really stressed out if 60 days from now, like we used to offer like a payment plan where you could do it for it was $600 a month. Like within 30 days, the people that would be stressed out, we'd be getting like emails from saying like, I'm not making my money yet. And it's like, hey man, we've done all this work and like you're $600 in. So 
that's why we structured mm-hmm. the way that we structured it to find a more advanced seller, I guess, or someone again yeah. that values all the work that's gone into it. So in order to start, people need, first of all, money. Second of all, company, right? Being opened already, have reseller certificate, been on Amazon already, have a seller. What else? Anything I'm missing? No, you just need the seller central account. We can't do anything without an account. It's hard to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're definitely not the company for someone that doesn't have an account yet. They're, they're, like Our training isn't formatted in the way that it's like, hey, here's how you your Amazon seller central account. Yeah, you how know, to like, open it. Yeah, there's plenty of people that talk about that, right? If you don't know what the buy box is yet, you might want to go through some like core training to to do that. I know that there's a lot of them out there that just teach the basics of selling on Amazon. But if you know what the buy box is, you have an account, you're going to want to have a resale certificate if you're located in the United States. If you're not in the U.S., if, not, if you're not in the U.S., we don't need that unless you have a U.S.-based account, like a U.S.-based business, which not everyone does. Some mm-hmm. people that are overseas have their businesses established wherever they're located. They got to deal with whatever tax authorities they got over there. Doesn't really come down on us. We just need the resale certificate so we don't have to charge sales mm-hmm. that we sell. So those are really the two things. A An established Amazon account, we're not even, we don't really even necessarily care whether there's an LC or anything behind it. Some people might be doing business as a sole proprietor which is under their personal name. Now, we don't recommend people do that, but it's not its not something that we're requiring. We do require basically the resale certificate. I don't think they can get reseller certificate if they don't have a company, is my understanding. Yeah, maybe as a sole prop, as long as you're registered, but probably not. Most people, I mean... <laughs> If you're going to start a business, at least do it the right way. Don't do it under your personal name. Separate it from your personal side of things. Do that first. Think of it as a business. Yeah. Treat it as a business. Treat it as a business, not a hobby. If you treat your business as a business, you'll get business-like results. If it's just a hobby, it's never going to be important enough. So I just wanted to mention that on your portal, on the seats, so there are training built in and training goes through basically how to place your order how to pick items you have several videos let's say is it a good product or not good product how to pick a good product basically to resell you have a couple videos about taxes which i remember you said go to professional (laughs) and uh, so anything else i forgot to mention no there's a lot of there's a lot of sourcing training in there That used to be like a real passion of mine was like just sourcing and teaching people how to source. So like for the first couple of years, I was very heavily involved in, in just putting training together and it's not like it changes, right? The, the like reading Keepa doesn't change. It's no different now than it was three years ago. So those videos don't necessarily need to be all that much updated, you know, and our whole philosophy is largely in line with what you see out there in the influencer space, which is make a bunch of small test purchases, get feedback, get data, and then make your replenishments from there. So I can't, I I don't know the exact amount of hours of sourcing training, which to me, like that's the most important part of the business anyway, Mm -hmm. knowing how to make educated decisions. But there's like 20 hours worth of sourcing training that you can go through. And out of those 20 hours, there's hundreds of products that we review. You know, that go through the good, the bad, what I like, what I don't like, how many I think that you should buy, you know, and again, it's funny, you'll see probably maybe some progressions through there. Like as we progress, you start saying, all right, buy a hundred of this instead of buy 20, you know? So if you're trying to, in some cases, the whole deal of wholesale is you know, gosh, how many times have you ever bought something that sold out really fast? And you're like, I wish I would have bought more of it. And you can't find them anymore if it's all on arbitrage. Can't find but it. Can. Yeah. 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 If you can't find it or a lot of times like the really good stuff, a little tip is if you could find stuff to where there's some scarce supply, those products tend to do really, really well because there's not the, there's not the pricing pressures that you're going to get when there's like months and months of supply. 
on the market of something. It's like the supply and demand. When you have three months worth of supply on the market, you're generally going to find a race down to whoever's willing to sell it for the least. If you have a like a really high demand product and there's less than a month worth of supply on the market, it's going to be harder to have that price pressure pushing it down. You know, like it's because there's just not enough to force the price down. So that's kind of like the dynamics of how the Amazon marketplace in a nutshell moves. It's it really is all about supply and demand and reading of the supply and demand hasn't really changed all that much over over the years. I guess you could look at it two ways. You could say, I'm going to buy a lot of something. The downside to that is if it takes up a large percentage of your inventory space, that could end up sucking <laughs> or a large percentage of your budget, which is why I think like the whole idea, <clears throat> especially for the first several months while people are getting kind of their feet wet is to just spread it out amongst a whole bunch of different things, learn how it flows, learn how it works, and then be able to, if you want to buy more, <clears throat> excuse me, if you want to buy more, you can start buying more. The nice thing about wholesale is most everything is replenishable. Most everything. There's seasonal stuff. There's times where things are going to be on short supply, or there's going to be times where there's things that are, there's going to be longer lead times because it's not necessarily in stock. But again, the flip side to those like products that have limited supply, that's where it's like you want to go a little bit heavier on because you're not going to be able to keep it stocked as easily. So I think that's just a challenge that we all go through as sellers on Amazon is like, how do we identify those products? It's not like there's no like red flashing sign that says this is a product where there's limited supply of it. Yeah, you know, buy, buy everything that you can. It so, comes with experience for sure. All I was going to say is that's usually going to come from, I ordered this many and only this many got fulfilled. And then the rest of it's not going to come for 60 days. You know what I mean? Or like you make an inquiry on something that's not in stock and you want to get, you want to know, Hey, what's the availability of this? Can you get it? When would it be here? So like th those might create opportunities for you. If you do a little bit extra due diligence, it might create opportunities for you to, for us to get from that supplier saying, yeah, this is a really hot product. This is a really popular product. The manufacturer is really backed up on it. So we're only going to be able to get 50 for the next 60 days or whatever. You know what I mean? That tends to lead to some good opportunities if you just ask. So we don't get that enough. Sadly, generally people are just looking for what's in stock. But if you want like a little pro tip, the stuff that's not in stock is sometimes going to be your very, very best stuff because it's not in stock. The reason is because Amazon sellers are very, very impatient. They want it today. I think human beings are impatient. You know, we want it today. We want it like as fast as humanly possible. So a lot of times people are only buying things that are in stock, whereas that out of stock product, the reason why it's so profitable is because there's limited supply of it. And that needs to be the one that you start like digging into because you might be able to find something that produces lots. We've had one product, it's starting to become more supplied now than it was, but this product one of our clients has made about seventy thousand dollars in profit on one SKU over the last. Was the ASIN accelerated down? <laughs> so I got a lot in my warehouse of it right now, so um, we should source I'll, after this. <laughs> so yeah, um, next. So this product was very. It was very back ordered from the supplier perspective. The manufacturer was only able to produce. A small number. So let's say I think the demand for it's 500 units a month, but you couldn't get 500 units. Nobody could get 500 units. You might get 100 here, and then two months from now, you might get another 200. Two months from now, you might get another 200, right? So that was kind of the, the demand was greater than the actual manufacturing supply was. The key was to be able to, like, it comes out to be pretty big purchase orders, like the person who was selling it was making pretty big buys on it where it was $30,000, but 
you know, it ended up producing all that revenue and the profit, knowing that everyone know was having a hard about. time. Are you talking about the doll, the scary doll? The- no, no, not that. <laughs> it was expensive. I looked at that product. It's very, the profit is really good. Just the item itself is a little bit. Yeah, that, that Chucky doll. I think it's a Chucky doll, right? I hear Keith on the other side of the wall over here. Keith, he does the onboarding calls for everyone. So I think he shows off the Chucky doll on every single one of those onboarding calls. I have a question forwarding what you said. I know what you're talking about. And I would say, yes, there are some items I purchased and it was either price went up or they were just like, you know, seasonal, let's say, items. They were out or they were discontinued by the manufacturer and the price went way up. My question is, can you really make it as a strategy to target only that type of products? Or it's more like occasional happens, but you never know what exactly will happen to this product. Yeah, I wish that I knew how to figure that out, right? I wish, like I said, if there was like a way to flag a product knowing that it was on short supply or manufacturing shortages. We're trying to build better relationships to where the suppliers would feed us that information. It hasn't necessarily gotten to that point to where they're like guiding us along the lines of saying, hey, this probably fits the kind of criteria that works for you guys and what it is that you you do over there on, on Amazon. But it's hard to tell of which ones those are without like talking directly with the manufacturer. I would say what one of our strengths <clears throat> is the fact that we have so many different types of suppliers. We have a lot of different wholesalers who have lots of relationships built with a lot of brands. But the downside to that is that we're not necessarily working directly with the actual brand. So we don't have that that feed into the rep at the manufacturing side for them to tell us what's on short supply. So like our strength is just sheer volume or number of supply. Weaknesses, we're not a stocking supplier. So like we're, we're I would say we're like between retail arbitrage or like whole, like online arbitrage and working one off with like the main, the actual distributors. We're like, we're like a business development arm of your company to where we're working with all of these distributors on your behalf. And we're relying on those distribution relationships that they have with the manufacturers. And through those relationships, those agreements with those suppliers generally pass through, someone might say, do we have, are we allowed to sell this stuff? That's a question that we get from people. And we have wonderful relationships with our wholesalers. Those wholesalers have contracts with the brands, the manufacturers, the products that they're selling. And through those contracts, their job is to sell it to whoever they deem As long as that manufacturer doesn't say no third-party sellers allowed, there's manufacturers that say that, and those distributors are going to say, we're not allowed to sell this to you because you're going to be selling it on a third-party marketplace. So 99% of the time, we're eliminating any issue that you're going to have with a brand that has problems with you selling their stuff. Mm -hmm. These distributors, they have agreements with the manufacturers and those agreements are essentially where our job is to distribute this product for you to whoever we deem necessarily. And through that distribution relationship, Ecom Solutions, Bold City Distributors is a distribution arm within their company, right? That's helping them get distribution into the Amazon marketplace, right? A lot of these companies, they're not servicing just Amazon sellers. They're servicing the local brick and mortar retailers, the convenience stores, the construction companies, the sporting goods stores. There's not many of those anymore, but they're servicing like the brick and mortar local areas. So whereas like we're sort of their sales arm to help them get more products into the Amazon marketplace without them having to work with hundreds of sellers because they don't want to deal with having hundreds and hundreds of relationships. So we're providing that service to them. And at the same time, providing the service to our selling partners, trying to connect the two together, right? That's like where we come into the, to the equation of 
we're working with these distributors. These distributors know exactly what we're doing. They love us. They ha we have great relationships with them. We send them a lot of volume, send them a lot of business in those relationships in the event that we need help because something on Amazon happens for whatever reason. We're there trying to help our selling partners, trying to make sure that we help people get any issues resolved as best as we possibly can. How many distributors is Ecom working at the moment? So we have 40. We do business mainly with 14 at this point. Now, like I said, part of our limitation is people. It's having enough people that are matching products up. So we're actively growing that department right now, which is our product matching side of the business, which will give us a lot more opportunity for us to onboard new suppliers. We've got more suppliers right now than we can realistically do anything with. So like we've got to be able to grow that team to be able to match those products. But like right now we have legitimately 40 plus relationships or open accounts, but we mainly do business with 14. Those mm -hmm. are like the ones that get most of our energy right now with the goal of growing it. Right. We want every supplier. We want to have a relationship with every single supplier, at least on the East Coast. The mm -hmm. West Coast ones probably don't want to ship to us. We're too far away. Yeah. Okay. So if you guys want to join Ecom Solution, there will be the link in the description. If you have any questions, ask us. We will help you, whatever you need. And if we don't know the answer, we know who to reach. Jason has been a wealth <laughs> of information and very helpful. Thank you, Jason, for all your time, you for your time. help, for all your knowledge. We really appreciate it. The weekly Facebook calls that you have scored, we didn't even get to those. Time-wise, we might not be able to ask you all the questions we have. And My let's pleasure. do it one more time. Let's do it again where you can show us how the software works and... Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. We could do that. Let's just set up another call. Yeah, shoot. I'm good. Yes. I actually wanted to say I had a prep center. I don't have any more. Ailey still has a prep center for online arbitrage. And I didn't even notice that you shipped anything. Because usually with the thing, it was like prep center. You just like on the phone all day because something goes wrong. Something mm. goes, comes, I don't know, damaged, leaked. Wrong yeah. item sent. Returns back. You have to do all that. Returns and all that stuff. Which is such a headache. Yes. Return the damaged items. Yeah. For now, like, I didn't make much profit yet. Well, the process of ordering, the process of shipping, it's so much faster and easier. That's 100% compared to online arbitrage because there are so many things could go wrong and it goes wrong. Not just like it could, yeah. it really goes yeah. wrong. And you need to like jump and a lot of time, my thing with the prep, it's easier for me to do, to do it like from home because I'm just like through the item to the box, put the label and return it. With them, I need to do extra work to just say what it is, where you need to return, send a shipping label and all that stuff. And we went through this. We know the difference. Might be someone who just started, don't know that. Yeah. Bit, unfortunately. The, 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 what the pain of doing it the hard way, like messing it up, messing up is usually going to be painful, but yeah. it humbles you. So you are more appreciative of the good things that come your way. Yeah. It's a good lesson to learn, you know, yeah. um, if you, yeah, if you've never had, if you've never gone through one of the mistakes, how do you know when something's good versus when you make a bad buy? What, why, what did I do wrong? I'm not sure that I believe in bad buys. I just think sometimes the markets change. Bad buys yeah. are usually going to be I bought this variation and this variation actually isn't the one that ever sells, but like most yeah. of the time, a bad buy isn't necessarily a bad buy. It's just the, the market dynamics have changed. The supply and demand economics have changed on that particular product. And then it's a matter of like, how am I going to make this particular product? And, you know, until you go through it enough times, you just don't really, the only way to learn in this game is doing it. That's true. Thank you so much for coming. Yeah, my I pleasure. Think... Thank you for having me. Let's set up another group. Yes, absolutely. Like a... I will. Thank you for coming. Yeah, thank you, Jason. Thank you. Have a great one. Yeah, All you right. as well. Bye.